All right, everybody, this is being recorded and something I say at the beginning of every single webinar is watch it again. I'm not doing that just to tout this product. It's actually because uh, I started out in college with a psychology degree. And one of the things that we learned there was that if you review the material relatively soon afterwards, some of those nuances will actually sink into your long term memory. Also, you know, I tried to build these uh, webinars out so that uh, you know, there's different nuances that uh, I try to teach so that you can remember them. You know, uh, one of the things was, you know, we have the Greeks and sometimes when you're trading options, all the Greeks seem a little bit scary. Uh, what do they really mean? And I try and have little things to uh, help you remember that, like theta. What is theta? Well, it's the thief in the night that comes and steals your premium. So um, those are kind of what we're going to be looking for, actually in the short iron condor. We want Theta to come in and steal our premium because we're gonna be collecting a credit for uh, this strategy. Therefore, we are gonna to wanna to be able to have this price go from a higher level to a lower level, right? If you sell high, then you wanna be able to buy that low and Theta will be one of the components that we're gonna be looking to exploit in this strategy. And I'll show you uh, what the best duration is in order to achieve that for this strategy anyway. All right, so this is going to be on the short iron condor. It is one of my favorites, especially for a market neutral strategy, or if you just have no idea where this is going to go and you want to have that defined risk in case uh, this start, uh, market starts to move uh, in any direction quickly. So we'll be able to manage some of the risk with it being defined and the beauty in an iron condor is it is adjustable. So throughout the life of this trade, if things start going a little bit awry, you can be a little bit more aggressive and mechanical in order to limit some of the losses that might be incurred if you are directionally wrong. All right, so let me get a couple of things out of the way real quick though. My name is Eric Wilkinson. I know there's a lot of new faces out there. Uh, you may recognize me as the Wolfman from mainstream media, where I've talked about everything from economic to geopolitical, and on top of that, my market analysis. And I actually started trading my own money, like I mentioned in college, uh, as a psychology degree, or with a psych psychology degree, decided to switch it over to finance, graduated from finance, uh, uh, with a finance degree, I should say, moved to Chicago, and started working on the floor of the Chicago Board of Trade. I actually started out as a runner, moved up into the pits and continued trading uh, throughout that time and to this point in time. So I've been doing it for a little over 25 years now. I've traded everything from stocks, financial futures, currencies, uh, and options on all these products in just about all market conditions. Actually, this market condition could be one of the craziest market conditions I've ever traded in. So. If you're trading through it, then uh, you guys probably have uh, been through the ringers as well. Uh, Zachary said he's seen me on CNBC with Rick. Okay, old school. Um, all right, so basically we got to go over this disclaimer and it says that we are not here to give investment advice. I don't know your risk parameters. I don't know what's in your portfolio, you guys. So I don't give investment advice. I don't try to say, hey, this stock is something that you guys should be putting into your portfolio. You might have a very different um, viewpoint on that underlying. So um, what I might be doing might be counterintuitive to what you're doing. And remember, past performance of any trading system or methodology is not necessarily indicative of future results. All right. If you're on Twitter, you can follow me personally at Wolfman's blog or our parent company is at ProTraderStrat or hopefully all kinds of market wisdom. And Facebook, if you're on Facebook, follow us at ProTraderStrategies.com. Uh, one thing we do on Facebook a lot is pump out content. So we're throwing out my daily market commentaries, for example, and sometimes uh, every once in a while, these webinars, webinars are, um, you know, well past, but usually some older webinars will throw on there. But the daily market commentaries are, you know, pretty pertinent to the time or the day. So I talk about all of my trades, when and where I do those trades, uh, so you can kind of follow along. And 
You know, the beauty in those is those are real life examples. They're what we go through on a daily basis when we're trading or we have a portfolio. If you have a portfolio or a 401k, an IRA, you know, you are constantly keeping an eye on that. Well, I talk about different ways to stay in uh, being mechanical in and around that type of portfolio. So whether it's covered calls or just regular trading strategies, I go through all of that stuff in those daily market commentaries using my trading portfolio. And I even talk about my IRA trades, IRA uh, trades as well. So um, all of those things are pretty pertinent on a daily basis. And as a matter of fact, I talk about my losers more than I probably talk about my winners because those losers are the ones that we need to stay mechanical with and continue to lower the cost basis and uh, stay diligent with. You know, most people out there are only gonna talk about their trades that they have a, as a winning trade. You know, you'll see, see those guys, had you done this call spread or this butterfly, you would have been up 650% or whatever. Well, you know, the fact of the matter is, is you don't see those guys really talking a whole lot about their losers. And those are the ones that we need to talk about because we learn from those, right? Um, so I'm not, I'm not afraid to talk about the ones that I'm losing on at the time because I've been here for 25 years, you guys, and uh, it's been working out pretty good to stay mechanical with these things. All right, the short iron condor. This is a great one, like I said, if you have a neutral market assumption, you think something's out of move and wants to settle down, this is a great strategy for that. And especially, you know, I see a lot of new faces out there or new names out there. This is a great strategy uh, to start learning uh, to trade options with, because like I said, it's limited risk. We want something to be range bound. You know, range bound doesn't mean it just necessarily trades straight sideways. What it means is, you know, you find something, maybe you like to trade with Fibonacci and um, some of those support resistances, but if something gets between like, say for instance, those support and resistances, and you can see it just kind of doing that, you know, well, that would be a great strategy to put on, uh, the iron condor, I should say, is a great strategy to put on something that's acting like that. Um, you know, if it's in your portfolio and, uh, you're tired of just seeing it not make you any money because it's going sideways. Well, this is a strategy you can put on around that underlying and uh, continue to gain a little alpha is what we would call that. That's basically alpha is, uh, you know, creating income on something that uh, really doesn't really do very well. Uh, it's over and above, I should say. Alpha is going to be over and above what you could uh, get with that current underlying. All right. So a couple of things we want. We want that range bound. We want volatility to collapse or crush is the best thing to have. We're also going to be looking to have some theta decay going on in there. All right. Uh, so all of those things culminating together will allow us to get in and out of this straight, this trade very quickly. A uh, couple of things to look at. You can look at it as a strangle, which is just a out of the money. I should probably put out out of the money call and an out of the money put. All right. So that creates the strangle. And if you've heard of that strategy, what we're doing with this one is we are just going to define that risk on that strangle. So it's a strangle with defined risk, which is right here. So basically, we're going to have a short out of the money call and a short out of the money put. And then we're going to define that risk by going a little bit uh, further away and buying a call and a put to define that risk. One thing you can also look at it as we're doing a call spread, a short call spread. It's going to be a short call spread and uh, a short put spread. All right. So short call spread, short put spread. We squish those two together and we are going to uh, create this short iron condor. So if you ever look at the analyze tab, this is kind of what it looks like, a short put spread. If the market goes higher, you know, if you start out right here, this is, you know, going down in price or up in price. On a short put spread, you would make money if the market went up. Well, on a short call spread, you make money if the market goes down, all right, goes into negative 
from where you bought it. Well, what we're trying to do is squish those together and we're gonna create the iron condor. Now, one thing to note, I talked about a little about volatility collapse. Well, with an iron condor, it's going to look like this on the analyze tab if you have low volatility. If you have higher volatility, you can see that these two love spots are a little bit further away than on the short implied volatility iron condor, all right? So um, what we wanna do is have those, we want a lot of room actually to be right. You know, this gives you more room to be right than with the low implied volatility on the short iron condor. So it allows us to have a little bit more wiggle room to be wrong, all right? So that's what we're gonna to try to do by building this out. One of the rules is we wanna build this out in high implied volatility with the expectation that ball will go down, all right? If you think volatility is gonna go up, you don't wanna put this strategy on. We want volatility to go down. So we've seen an unprecedented amount of volatility happening right now. And we are starting to come out of that, right? You know, what, volatility is just a fear indicator. It's people are afraid or they're trying to put on protection. And when they're buying puts, uh, that has a tendency to spike volatility. If you buy calls also, that's a, uh, a factor that goes into volatility as well. But it's the buying of premiums. As those premiums go higher, uh, that increase, that is a correlation to higher volatility. Well, the idea is when everybody is buying that, they have a tendency to get a little too aggressive. You know, when there's fear, they don't really care what they're paying for it. They just want that protection. And that is usually a time to take advantage of it because uh, their fear is overstated, you know, just kind of like with the coronavirus. Yes, it was a scary thing, but was it a little bit, are we starting to figure out it was maybe a little bit, uh, overdone well it very well could have been so that would be the time to take advantage of it uh take advantage of that was how the puzzle uh was puzzle how the pl of the iron condor is like a strangle or do you mean a short strangle short strangle i mean a short strangle the pnl of the iron condor is like a strangle yes i meant like a short strangle iron condor a long iron condor would be like you know, a long strangle uh, with the uh, with selling an option against it. I don't I don't do long iron condors really at all. Um, I do the short iron condors. I think there's better strategies out there than the uh, long iron condor. To be quite honest, all right. Uh, market neutral is the equivalent of a new date that you will never get anywhere with. Well. Market neutral, if you have the underlying, it, you're right. It's not going to go anywhere. And this is a way to uh, pay for that date. How's that? <laughs> All right. All right, max profit. Our max profit is going to be the premium received minus those commissions, All right. So any time we're collecting a credit, max profit is that credit we're going to be receiving. Now, we have two break even or two, sorry, max losses on this, but it's going to be the same amount, all right? So we have that short call spread that we talked about because the market can only go in one direction at any given time, right? So we have a max loss to the upper band if it rallies too far, and that's gonna be the short call minus the, uh, or the long call minus the short call, just to keep it so it's not negative, uh, and minus that premium. So basically, we're looking at whatever the width is, up here, whatever the width is minus that premium, okay? And same down here, whatever the width is uh, minus the premium is our max loss. Because remember, this is our max profit. The width is the entire range. Um, so once we take subtract out our credit, because we get to keep that credit no matter what, um, then what's ever left over on that width of the spread is what our max loss could be. And just like the max loss, you guys, we're going to have two break evens. And the break evens are going to be the short call strike, which is going to be closer 
then the long call strike, the long call strike is going to be further up the option montage, plus the premium. Anytime you get a premium, anytime you collect a credit, that increases your distance away from where your break evens are, all right, or where your short strikes are. So if I'm short a call and I collect a credit, it means it's higher. It means it can go higher than that short call by that premium, all right? And vice versa on the short put, that credit helps us. So it goes further down the option montage uh, to help us, all right? So when we're looking at the, uh, somebody is looking, could you go back to the previous slide, please? Uh, yeah, we can go back to the max loss. So the only reason why I wrote these different, the long call and the short call, if we look at it as the option montage, let's say XYZ is trading at 100 right now. So we're looking at XYZ, it's trading at 100, all right? So basically 95 on the option montage, right? 90 kind of goes like that. And then we'll be looking at like 105, 100, or sorry, 110, um, you know, and going further up. So if we were doing this as selling the 105 calls, right, and buying the 110 calls, which is a little bit higher, uh, and then the put side, let's say we were selling with 95 puts, and then buying the 90 puts, okay, because it's further away. The reason why I wrote it as the long call, because when you say the long call minus, I wouldn't want to say this minus this, because then that gives us a negative number, really. And then, you know, you get a negative number plus another subtracting, it's, it's going to get a little wanky. So basically, that's why I was saying it's the distance between these two. So that would be $5, right? And $5 here is the distance, the width between the two. That make it make a little more sense for everybody. So basically, it's the width of the spread, you know, the call spread over here, and the put spread here. All right. And let's just say we collected, a, you know, we could say our credit, we got a credit of a dollar. Let's just say a dollar sixty, which would be in line with my my rules there. So let, if we got a dollar sixty credit then we know that our max loss would be $3.40 in this case, right? Because it's $5 wide. We've got a $5 wide spread minus the $1.60 we collected, which is our credit we get to keep. So that makes our break or our uh, max loss is $3.40, okay? That makes sense there. And if I use that same example over here, uh, where we were talking about our short call, right? Our short call was looking at that 105 strike, right? So our short calls, the 105 calls, plus the premium, which I said was $1.60. Then in this case, XYZ's break even, our break even would be basically 106.60, all right? And from the put side, I think I said it was that we're getting short the 95 puts in our uh, hypothetical scenario. And then we subtract our dollar sixty, right? So we subtract our dollar sixty. Now our break even is at 93.40. Right? Is there a credit? And our credit there. Okay. So that credit is always going to help us. All right, so we know all those break-evens, all that stuff. Now, let's come up with a scenario. X, Y, Z, for instance, we can still go with that. We have a market neutral assumption. One thing we need to know is, can we trade options around X, Y, Z? You know, is it something where there's a lot of eyeballs on it? Are a lot of people participating in it? Well, we need to know if we're picking the right underlying. And one of my rules for this is, we need to have a tight bid ass spread on this. And uh, when we're looking at this, I always say, you know, if it's a hundred dollar stock or less than a hundred dollar stock, then our bid to the offer in the option montage needs to be less than or equal to 10 cents, right? And if it's greater than a hundred dollar stock, if it's greater than a hundred dollar stock, then our bid to the offer needs to be 
uh, less than or equal to uh, basically moving the decimal three ticks to the left. So if we're if XYZ is trading 100, you know that would be 10 cents. If it's like a $253 stock, we'd move it three ticks to the left and we would say, you know, 25 cents. It's gotta be in the option montage. Now, that is a green light, all right? So in this example, we're looking at a green light and I can't do the pin on this. Can you go back one slide uh, on the break even? Should be higher than the strike on the puts. Um, on the break even, the strike, no, it should be less than. So think about it, if the market is going up, right? That credit plus the call strike gives us our break even to the upside and to the downside, it can go through our short puts by a dollar sixty because we got to keep that credit so it goes lower. Does that make sense? I'll show you when we pull up the uh, option montage here and set or everything up in a second. So just for an example, let's just go over and uh, try and find the, I don't know what happened there. Um, so let's look at this one, for instance, with gold, right? We can pull up gold and say, uh, gold is a $161 stock. We may move it three ticks to the left. We should be looking at, um, 16 cents. Sorry. Doesn't like it when I draw straight down. Looks like we're looking at 16 cents. So we kind of come down here to the the spot month. That's gonna be the one where the most op, uh, eyeballs are and that generally speaking comes in close to where 35-ish uh, days to expiration. And you can see even after the close, it's 10 cents wide there, it's 10 cents wide there, so 10 cents wide there. So it is less than or at least equal to less than 16 cents. Um, I'm not actually, wanting to look into the money. We want to look at the ones that are just out of the money for this rule. Uh, I drew it a little bit farther, but you can see that that's fitting that rule of moving that decimal place a couple of ticks there. You know, we could look at Cisco and say, all right, uh, it's under a hundred dollars stock. And we kind of look at the option montage. You can see it's less than 10 cents wide. So it fits that rule, you know, during open market operations, we could even look at something as big as Tesla and say that we're gonna move that decimal a couple of ticks. Oh, well, hold on, I gotta pull it up. Uh, move that decimal three ticks to the left and we got 78 cents, right? And then look down here at the option montage and it should be close to about 78 cents that during open market operations. Right now it's after the close, a lot of people have canceled their orders, but I. I've been, uh, I looked at it yesterday and the day before, uh, and it was fitting that rule. So make sure that when you're doing this, it is during the open market operations. Okay. We don't want to really look at that rule afterwards. You know, a lot of people do their analysis afterwards and might look at this and say, ah, oh, Tesla, how does it not fit that rule? Well, during the open, when there's a lot of eyeballs in there, it will. Uh, generally speaking. So um, something to note with this, uh, another thing I like to say is, you know, it's kind of like a uh, a green light kind of thing. So if it fits my rule there, that's a green light. You know, uh, if it's, for instance, the, you know, $100, if it's less than $100 stock, right? If it's less than $100 stock, uh, then that's gotta be equal to or less than 10 cents wide. And then if it's greater than a hundred dollars stock, then, then it uh, needs to fit that rule of less than or equal to moving the decimal three ticks to the left, all right? So for instance, if it's something like Tesla, um, when Tesla gets, crazy volatility starts to spike, you know, you might see a situation where you can look at these and say, all right, well, if it is two, two times my rule, then that's a yellow light, you know, proceed with caution. 
make sure you're really diligent about not just necessarily going to the mid market. You might want to go since we're collecting a credit a little higher than mid market. You know, enter that order. It doesn't cost you anything to enter an order and cancel it. So you want to enter that order. Maybe by the time you go enter that order, go back to your order book, cancel, replace, you know, go down a couple of pennies, you know, collect a little bit less credit, go down a couple of pennies, enter it, cancel, replace. I'm not saying wait like an hour, but don't go all the way to the bid either. We're gonna have a certain parameter that will give you a pretty good guideline as to where the correct pricing is for this. Um, so make sure you're kind of following along with all of these different guidelines and it should lead you to a relatively close and fair uh, price for what we're able to collect for this particular strategy. All right, so the environment, I've mentioned this, we want that volatility crush, right? We want volatility to go down, all right? So how do we get volatility? How do we set ourselves up for a situation where volatility will go down? And I mentioned this, when volatility is at extreme levels, that's when we wanna take advantage of it. Or when you're starting to feel like, all right, well, I think a lot of the unknown is coming out of this market. Well, volatility should start coming down as well. So picking the right environment, we wanna start out where volatility, we want volatility, to be high, All right? And how do we tell if volatility is high? I'm not talking about the VIX. I'm not talking about just looking at volatility in particular for an underlying. We need to know every underlying has its own volatility coefficient, all right? And yes, we've just had a black swan event. The last time the VIX was this high was basically back in 2008 and 2009. The VIX is pricing in you know, almost 2% moves every day. Uh, you know, when it was up in the 80s, it was pricing in about 10% moves. Um, but, you know, as that volatility comes out of it, uh, then that's when you can take advantage of it. So when we're looking at our uh, stocks to trade, right, what I'm saying here is Tesla, 84. What does that mean? 84% volatility. Is that high or low? We don't know. If I look at Tesla and compare it to, you know, Cisco, Cisco's got a 43%. Well, that doesn't tell me anything about each individual underlying. So what we need to do is have our, what is, I don't know how to, how do we get rid of this? I don't even want that up there. Um, so volatility, this 45, well, you can see on this chart, this is implied volatility. And that's really what we want to look at. And we have had a black swan event like this, Unless you think that volatility is going to skyrocket when we uh, start opening up more and maybe see more coronavirus uh, outbreaks and stuff like that, where volatility could start creeping up. If you believe that, then you probably shouldn't be selling credit spreads. Uh, and this is an iron condor, and we're going to be collecting a credit for this. Um, so if you believe volatility is going to start creeping up, then you wouldn't want to sell options, all right? But if you believe that volatility is going to come back down into like normalcy, which, you know, this is what Cisco's volatility is generally at, you know, for the last probably five, six years, where a high would be about 40 for Cisco. Well, we could say that volatility is still relatively elevated for Cisco. And in normal times, I talk about how to come up with implied volatility percent but because this has really kind of thrown everything into a tailspin, I usually talk about this as, you know, for a stock, we want implied volatility percent to be above 50. Well, you can see right here, implied volatility percent is only about 41. So it doesn't really fit that rule for normal market conditions. But we aren't in normal market conditions. We can see that, uh, it is still relatively high. And when it went up there, it didn't last very long. Uh, so I would say that Cisco is still seeing high volatility. And for an ETF, you know, this is a stock. An ETF is a basket of goods. I would say that un under normal circumstances that we are looking at an ETF being above 30, all right? 
So those would be considered high. Im uh, implied volatility percent of a stock above 50, implied volatility percent of an ETF above 30 is considered high. Um, and if we go over here to the option montage, we can see that uh, it is also for at least our purposes on, or my purposes for TD Ameritrade or Thinkorswim, it gives me the implied volatility percent down here. All that is, is it's where it currently is. We have a numerator and a denominator where it currently is, minus the low, and then you divide that sum by the high minus the low. All right, and that will give you the implied volatility percent. All right. So if you believe it's gonna, you know, this is the new normal, then we need to at least take that into account. I don't think that this is the new normal. A little bit higher volatility could be. So, um, you know, all of those things are things that you're gonna have to really think about. I think volatility is gonna kind of come back into normalcy, even if we start seeing some of this uh, spike in Corona, I think that that's gonna be kind of expected uh, going forward that we're gonna see some pockets of outbreaks um, and people are gonna get used to that. And when they get used to that, volatility will kind of normalize. So uh, not that I'm bearish or market neutral on Cisco, uh, I, I, can make a, I can make an assumption for any of those. All right, so we wanna pick the right duration. Right here, we're looking for picking the right underlying. That's my rule for the price, right? On the option montage, the environment, we want high implied volatility, the duration. So this is, you know, in a sense, this is Vega. Oops. Let me go back one. This is Vega. So environment Vega or volatility, which is equal to volatility or implied volatility, which is really what we're looking for. And then the duration, remember I said at the very beginning, we're looking for that thief in the night to come and steal our premium. Well, that thief is called theta, right? So we're gonna be looking at theta to be at its best, greatest. And usually, actually always, theta is going to start getting really aggressive inside of 35 days to expiration. Well, you're not always going to get an option montage or an option expiration cycle that has 35 days in it. Sometimes it's gonna be a little less, sometimes it's gonna be a little bit more. Right now, the closest to that 35 days to expiration is a little bit more. It's kind of landing right in here. I would default to go a little bit further out. Usually when you get in here, uh, the premiums actually, you know, the next monthly is basically eight days to go. So, um, you're not gonna get a whole lot of premium collection in there. And I'm not looking to hold on to it this entire time. I'm only looking to be in this for a couple of uh, weeks at best and get in and out of these strategies quickly, right? I don't want to try and get every penny out of this. I'm looking to swing for singles, doubles, and sometimes triples. But at the end of the day, I wanna be out of this strategy quickly as soon as I see my profit uh, start coming in. So we want to take advantage of this theta decay uh, speeding up. You know, the thief is uh, not very aggressive out here, but once he gets inside of here, sees he only has a little bit of time left, he starts really picking away at your credits. And that's what we want uh, so that we can buy it back for less. All right. Another thing to think about this as if this is the price. This line is the price of what your premiums are and how they start really decreasing. Well, something that happens with volatility, if volatility starts coming into the market, volatility kind of pushes up on this curve and it kind of sends those premiums higher. So we get the theta coming out a little bit, but that volatility pushing up on it. And then when that volatility comes out, it catches up to the curve. So if we can get in when volatility is really getting pumped up, you can think about it as a balloon and blow into that balloon. It starts really expanding that balloon. Well, that's what volatility does. And then what happens when you let out the volatility? That balloon just flattens out, right? So we want to get in there when the volatility is expanded out and then 
uh, take advantage of all of that volatility coming out of that balloon when it, it happens. Uh, what is the vertical axis? Uh, this is this is the price. Uh, why am I pen working? Oh, because I have it on the. Uh, this is the basically option prices over here. All right. And you know, when we're looking at option prices, we're looking at pennies or whatever. So it's like, think of it as, you know, 50 cents if you're looking at the option montage. And remember every, every one lot in an option is equivalent to a hundred of the underlying. So, you know, that's why that's showing it at 50, should be 50 cents, move the decimal times 100. That makes sense? Okay. Something like that. Um, all right, so uh, here's another thing. I'll just pull this up while I'm thinking of it. Another thing we can look at here is get rid of that. Go over to the Cisco trade again. Um, and when we're talking about the theta, this is where I'm talking about right here, the thief theta. You can see that theta is always going to be negative. And that's because we can't, we aren't back to the future. We can't go back in time. Um, and therefore it is always Take, ticking away at the premium. So tomorrow, if nothing else happened in Cisco and it was trading exactly right here at 41.37, tomorrow three cents would come out of all of these premiums and two cents out of these premiums up here, vice versa, uh, the equivalent. Two cents out of this premium and one cent out of these premiums, all right? Um, and if I go further out in time, you'll see that uh, theta is much less. Right, so this is going out on that curve. You can see it's only one cent out here a day. So we wanna take advantage of the higher theta decay. And you'll see it even uh, more so if we looked at something like Tesla, it'll be more apparent even, where uh, theta is about 84 cents here. And then we go way out in time, you can see that theta is almost half of that way out the curve, right? So we want that, Theta to tick away from us uh, at our premiums. So we want that 84 cents coming out every day, right? Because we're short premium. Okay. All right. So picking the right strikes. What we're going to do here is ultimately we want to collect. So this is where I was talking about if you're in one of those yellow green light kind of things, we want to collect 25% on the minimum to about 33% the width of the strikes, all right? So when we were looking at that $5 wide, remember I came up with a, you know, pulled it out of my hat, $1.60? Well, that's because that's within that rule. Okay, um, I thought I saw a couple questions coming up, but it looks like you guys are on it. Uh, so we wanna collect 25 to 33% the width of the strikes. So if we have a dollar wide, which is gonna be something that's less than $50, this is a little bit harder to do on those really low flyer stocks, but a uh, dollar wide uh, spread, right? We would need a credit of somewhere between 25 cents and 33 cents, right? That's, you know, a dollar. Um, and you know, a $5 wide, it's gonna be somewhere around $1.40 to a dollar sixty-ish. I don't know if you guys can hear that going on. My dog's having a dream in the background. Um, and the easiest way to figure it out is like, you know, if you're looking at something that was a five dollar wide spread. Where's my? Oh, I saw it. It's hidden. Oh, it's hidden underneath my. Uh, hold on, my. Where did you go? Somewhere it is hidden underneath one of my, ah, come on calculator, why are you hiding on me? All right, I'll bring it up here. There, I had to move everything around on my other screen. <laughs> it's gonna be difficult. 
Everything is trying to fight me right now. I'm, I'm battling. All right, where are you, calculator? There you are. All right, so, um, you know, $1.60 in that one example of our $5 wide, remember X, Y, Z? So $1.60 divided by five, whoops. So we got $1.60 divided by $5. You can see it's 32% with the strike. So that would be within that rule. And if it was something like, let's say it's $1.45 divided by $5, it's 29%. So you're gonna look at it that way, all right? Uh, so when you're building out this strategy, and it usually ends up being our short strikes, our short strikes, our short call, and put are going to be about a 20 ish delta 20 ish is not always exactly but that's where we're going to start to build out this strategy all right so when we go in there and we're going to look at this you know you know i know you can go online and find out how to do a short iron condor but they are going to build it out like this you guys they're not going to give you strike locations to increase your probabilities of success. And this is the best bang for your buck. Yes, you can go further out. Uh, you know, you can go out to like a 10 delta short call and put, and yes, you are gonna have a high probability of success with that strategy, but your risk versus your reward is not going to work out. Your reward is nothing versus the risk that you're gonna be taking on. So uh, the 20 ish delta, it's a nut, you know, you're collecting a third the width of the strikes. Your, uh, your risk reward is the best. You know, if you go a little bit tighter, yes, you are going to collect more premium and you can collect up to 50% the width of the strikes. All right. Um, but then you are going to be very close to uh, losing money easily, is the way of the lack of a better way to put it. Um, this, the beauty in this is where our short strike is, there's a lot of things that I talk about when we're collecting a credit, is the, the bell curve. And when we're talking about collecting, you know, uh, starting out at that 20-ish delta, it's going to be basically landing somewhere in here, all right? But when we collect that credit, it basically puts us at one standard deviation, all right? So with our break even, you know, our break even ends up being very close to a one standard deviation move, which is something I really like is that one standard deviation uh, on either direction. So our break even, anything above that would be the loss or anything below uh, the break even to the put side would be a loss. But, you know, we are looking at something where 68% of the time, the market's going to land somewhere in there, all right? So our probabilities of success are very good, all right? Yes, our strike locations inside of that wheelhouse, but we have to look, I look at anything like a break even as a win, you guys. If I can break even on something, that is going into the win camp, all right? If I don't lose money and I'm, I'm break even, that's a win, all right? Because that's, uh, I didn't lose anything. Losing is where I look at it like I didn't win. Um, but break even, I didn't lose anything. It didn't hurt me to be in it. So uh, by collecting this credit, starting out about the 20-ish delta, it puts us at a one standard deviation move, which means that basically, you know, 16% of the time it'll land up here. 16% of the time it's going to land out here. Something to note with standard deviation, the standard deviation curve, percent is basically equal to delta, all right? That's one of the beauties with the standard deviation curve. So you can talk about it as delta. And that's why you'll hear a lot of option strategy guys go, um, you know, what do you think the probability of this happening is? And you'll say, I'd say it's about a 50 delta. I mean, it's about a 50-50 chance. 50% of the time, but the option guys always like to throw in delta because it's equal to percent, right? Something uh, that's at least floor trader guys used to do that all the time. Um, what are the chances that the, uh, I don't know, 
I, I, was, I always want to relate it to baseball or something like that, but or football, and it's not going to work out right now because I don't know who's – there's nobody playing. What's the chances in this upcoming golf tournament that Phil beats Tiger? Well, it's about a 30 delta. All right. Knowing our exit strategy. All right. Basically, if you are at 25% decrease, you know, 25% decrease in that credit, right? In less than 15 days, I would say take it. All right. Usually I'm looking at somewhere about 50%. This is for higher risk tolerance um, in less than 29 days. That's kind of like what we're looking at, all right? So you get, you know, two or three days, which is probably not going to happen. You would have to really get volatility to happen almost immediately after you put on this trade. But if it if you can get 25%, less in uh less than 15 days then jump on it you know if you're looking at that one where we were looking at 33 cents you know collection of credit you're probably going to have to look at the 50 percent of max profit all right just to make it worth your while all right but if it's something like tesla and you know you're collecting a nice big premium for it then i would be looking closer to the 25 percent all right uh, the 20 delta is the short leg on the call side and the put side. That is correct. So here, let's look at a couple of quick examples. So on something like what we were looking at is, okay, so ConocoPhillips. Now, if you thought that ConocoPhillips, and I did this during open market operations because I was, I was worried that the markets were going to get really wide. They have a tendency to get really wide right now um, after the closes. But you can see with ConocoPhillips, I got short the 49 calls, which is uh, this strike right here. It's about that 29-ish delta, right? Well, and then I bought the 50 calls, all right? So the 50 calls is where I define that risk. It's a dollar wide collecting 32 cents. So this puts it very close to, uh, you know, that it's not going to work out on this one, but you can see that obviously uh, my break even is at 49.32 because I get to keep that credit. Um, and very close to the one standard deviation move. Uh, if we go to the put side, you can see I used the 34s as the short um, on this one and the 33s as the long. So I, you know, it's a little bit better than that 16-ish delta. Obviously, I kind of skewed this one a little bit, um, which you can do. Uh, it doesn't always have to be exactly equal distance away. Although these are pretty pretty close to being equal distance away, but I I'm a little bit more say nervous to the downside. Sixteen delta is one standard deviation, correct? Yes, sixteen delta is one standard deviation away. Because basically, if we look at this strat, if we base up, if you add up between one standard deviation and two standard deviations, thirteen point six, uh, the two point one. The point one plus you got remember you got a negative four uh, uh, standard deviation so all of those ends up being very close to a sixteen delta. All right. The key is get out early and often, and I did one on uh, GLD, which uh, is probably one I'm going to look to put on tomorrow. All right, so let's just uh, see if we can get GLD to pull up for us. Um, and as you can see, $5 wide collecting $1.56, that fits my rule. Um, okay, isn't one standard deviation move in the center the 68%? No, it, what we're saying, what, we're, what I'm trying to explain here is so 68% of this time, it stays within. If you go outside or right to here is the one standard deviation move. So if you start out at zero, which means X, Y, Z is trading 100, right? When we got into the strategy, we would be looking at these being, uh, you know, it's going to be further away. But in my example, it's, so this would be the 95s, the puts, right? 
um, and this would be the 105s, which you know isn't a very great example. I'd probably want it to be further away than that, but just as the example, so the 95 puts are that way. So basically, when you start out at zero, standard deviation says basically it's going to stay within one standard deviation move 68% uh, of the time. 16% of the time, it's going to go outside of one standard deviation move. 2% of the, or 2.1% uh, 2 of the time, it's uh, going to go outside of two standard deviation. All right. Does that make sense? A probability curve for uh, time of expiration, the probability of kissing is different. Yes. Good, good point, Wally, and I almost forgot to mention that. So it's a floor trader hack for you guys. So let's look at um, uh, this GLD trade. <clears throat> so what Wally's talking about here is one thing we're talking about with Delta. Delta tells us the probability of X, Y, Z. And if we looked at this strategy, let me pull this up again. So I'm gonna look at about the 20 ish Delta. I'm gonna sell those. And I'm going to look at about $5 higher. So uh, usually on about $150 stock, it's about $5 wide. I just know that as uh, kind of a given just start out at. Um, so I'm going to buy those. Uh, that wasn't a very good credit. Um, so I'm probably going to have to go a little bit tighter than that. 74, I'll probably have to go to the example I had before. So $5 higher, um, 65 cents. That's about right. I'm just doing the math in my head. 65 and 65 is going to give me about a dollar twenty, dollar thirty. So I'm going to look at the 20-ish delta here, um, just to see if I can get her done, and go five dollars lower, which puts me at the uh, 40, uh, 46 strike. Buy those. Oh, why didn't I do that? Am I not holding down control? So the 20-ish delta. 51s, 46s, that's $5 wide. Go up here to the, uh, what was I looking at? The 73s, 73s, and then $5 higher is going to be the 78s. So $1.39. It's changed a little bit since the last one I had. So $1.39, now we have to look at this and say that's pretty low. $1.39. Divided by five, see if it gets inside of that 25%. And it and it works. It's inside that 25%. So we could do this one. Um, so one of the things that Wally mentioned was we look at these strikes here. So the short, the 73s and the short 51s, let's look at, all right? So those are the ones we're looking at. And what we're looking at is the delta, right? So the 73s are lined up right here. And that's the ones we're short, and the 51s is the one we're short here. Okay. So delta tells us the probability of this underlying being one penny in the money at expiration is 23%. That's what we were just kind of talking about over there on the standard deviation curve. So that means that in the next 43 days, for GLD to be above at 173.01 cents is a 23% chance of that happening, right? It talks about our delta and our, our standard deviation curve, right? Well, floor trader hack is, yes, during the time when we see the market, like if we're looking at a chart and it goes, wah, 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 right? Charts do that. Well, that means that, you know, this could be 173 up here. And this could be our 151 here or something like that, right? So the chances of, or down here anyway, so the chances of the market coming up and hitting our 173 is two times the delta. So two times delta is our probability of getting kissed. All right, so that means the market can come up and hit us, you know, now it's 46% uh, of the time. So 46, percent of the time during the next 43 days 
yes, that 173 might get tested uh, or the 151s might get tested 40% of the time, right? So 40% of the time, it'll come down there and hit it. So it's a good chance that you're going to get tested or get kissed on these as the market comes up and hits that 173, all right? But that's just, you know, those that just kind of allows you to keep your powder dry, you guys. You know, things I talk about is the probabilities of things happening. And when you know the probability, when you know the facts, you're a lot, it's just like volatility. When you don't know what's going to happen, that volatility spikes, that fear uh, spikes and makes you do irrational things like go out and buy calls and you don't even care what you're paying for them or buy puts because you're afraid of the downside. You don't care. I don't care. I just want to buy them, All right? That's what people do. And that's because it's of the unknown. They don't understand what's happening. So when you do understand what's happening, which I what that's one of the things I try to do and teach is make sure you guys understand uh, what we're getting ourselves into, right? And the probability of us getting kissed on the 143s to the upside or the 151s is about 40%, right? Great. Now I know. If it happens, you're like, I still got a 60% chance this is going to work out, all right? Um, so knowing those things will help you. Yes, somebody threw out there, uh, can you adjust this strategy? Yes, you can. Uh, one thing I talk about is when your break even is being tested, if you're worried about it not coming back and you want to be a little more aggressive, if, for instance, the market rallied up to this 150 or 173 level or was trading 174, 175, you can move because this put spread down here now is almost worthless, right? This put spread down here is going to have decayed and been uh, useful to you. All that collection because of the market moving away from you has gone to relatively zero. You can move that entire put spread up to the 173 level. You create basically an iron condor. It's gonna be a tight iron condor. And uh, you know, especially if it's closer to expiration, maybe there's only 10, 15 days left expiration and all of a sudden this goes to garbage or hell in a handbasket or whatever you want to say. Well, then you can be a little bit more aggressive and say, all right, well, the probabilities are beating me on this. I need to collect a little bit more credit and you can move that whole put spread all the way up here. So now it's going to be like 173 uh, minus the $5 is going to be 173, 168, all right? So it becomes an iron condor, which is what we did last week, right? We talked about the iron condor. This is going to be a lot tighter iron condor uh, because we're just being um, mechanical. But you'll be able to collect, you know, another dollar something for that credit. So now it'll be like risk one to make one. Um, and it won't be like risk one uh, or uh, risk two to make one kind of thing. All right. So you'll be able to collect another credit. Uh, increase your break evens a little bit, you know, and and hopefully if it comes back, then nails you right there on 173 at expiration. You get to collect all of that money, all right? So that's a way to be a little bit more aggressive. If it rallies up too far and it hits your break even, uh, I usually just I usually play out the probabilities. You guys, I'm willing to take the entire loss uh, if it doesn't work out. I'm going to play let the probabilities play out. Um, Every once in a while though, you know, my if it's very close to expiration and all of a sudden this kind of goes goes to garbage, then I'll be a little bit more aggressive. I will move that put spread if it's rallied too far or vice versa if it's sold off, move that call spread down. Okay. Yeah, 173, 168. Are you saying that the legs on the call side can be changed? Uh, 175, 160, uh, I'm saying, um, let's say for instance, let's just go over here and uh, right now we have this strategy on, right? So we're looking over here at the charts and the market moves, I'll just do a vice versa example. Market moves down here, uh, you know, we put the strategy on tomorrow and um, you know, this market kind of kind of trickles down. Now we're very close to 
expiration, right? And all of a sudden it starts dropping a little bit. Well, this call spread up there, we had a call spread that's way up here, right? We're short a call spread way up there and we're long this put spread or short, sorry, we're short this put spread right down here. Well, this put spread is getting tested. So what we can do is offset this by buying, buy, buy this call spread and then sell a call spread down here, a little bit closer. Right. Sometimes you'll make it an iron condor. It's a really tight iron condor, which would be a better case scenario. But, you know, if it moved too fast or whatever, you could basically move that call spread down uh, to where your put spread is. And that creates the iron butterfly. Because remember, iron butterfly or short strikes are the same. All right. I wouldn't necessarily invert this, though. Don't go too far. I would go to where the puts are in this case or, you know, match up the short put and the short call. Okay, so in this case, then when we're looking over here, uh, in a sense, what we would do is, right, if that market went down and now all of this area was gray, like the market had gone all the way down to, let's say, 150, uh, 149 or something like that, you're really nervous about it. So what you would do is you would basically roll the call spread down. So you're going to go in and you're going to sell out of the the 178 and you're going to buy back the 173s because that's worthless you're going to basically buy that call spread you're going to buy that call spread back for you know maybe a dime or you know 25 cents and then you're going to go down and you're going to sell you know they're not you're not going to get this much premium for it cuz the market's gone down but then you would sell the 151s and then buy the, the 156s, right? So see how that creates the, I, I must have done that wrong. What did I do wrong? I wanted to sell, sell, all right, whatever, think or swim, let me do this. Um, I need to sell the 153s. Not let me do that for some reason. Why won't let me do that? So we'll sell the 151s in the calls. And I wouldn't do it this big anyway, but just, oh, and I did it backwards. We're going to be wanting to buy the 156s. All right. So that creates that iron butterfly. Short the calls, short the puts, long the calls, long the puts. All right. And you'd be able to collect another credit for it. Not going to be that much of a credit, but you, you get my gist. Cool. We clear? All right, cool. All right, so I don't usually talk about the adjusting. I actually have a whole webinar on where I've actually done that in real time too, but uh, that is something since somebody was asking to go over. All right, so this is our uh, strategy or our course that we're giving away for $4,497, you guys, take advantage of it. You know, like I said, you can go out there and figure out how to do an iron condor online. They're going to tell you to sell a short call spread, a short put spread, but they aren't going to give you strike locations. They're not going to give you the reasons why. You're not going to find out some of these nuances that I've learned over the course of my 25-year trading. So if some of this stuff has resonated with resonated with you, then Take advantage of this uh, this offer because you know knowledge will help you. I mean, I've spent more in uh, courses like this. We have to educate ourselves to get become better traders, all right. And in order to do that, you want to learn from somebody who's been through it. And I have. I'm you know I'm there for you. I'm I, I believe me. I've seen the pain and anguish, and I know that. When I, it drives me nuts to watch people on TV or in other webinars and stuff like that when they're talking about, hey, you know, I've got a directional assumption to the upside and we're just going to go out there and we're going to buy calls based on this um, indicator, all right? Well, I don't disagree with their indication or uh, what their directional assumption is created through those uh, indicators. What I disagree with is you can't just every time you have a bullish assumption, go out there and buy calls and buy puts on a bearish assumption. It doesn't work that way. 
you can be directionally right when you're putting on the wrong option strategy and lose money, all right? If you bought calls and volatility exploded and you were right on the directionality, those calls increasing in value off of that can offset all of that uh, money you should have made, you know? So there's a right time and a place and a right duration for every option strategy. And what I try to do, just like in these courses, is funnel you into it. You know, we go through it. We all start out with an option or a, a, a market assumption, right? And if we don't have a market assumption, then we're you and the iron condor. But uh, all of those things lead us to the right option strategy to increase our probability of success, right? Because we're not always right. And with these types of strategies that I teach, you know, I've showed in other webinars as well where I'm directionally wrong, especially in the daily market commentaries. You guys should take advantage of those. I show where I'm directionally wrong. I was a complete potato is what my kids would call it uh, and was wrong on my directional assumption. But here I am walking away laughing because I made money. Yeah, I may have come up with my own indicator and I was directionally wrong. Well, you would have lost money had you done it any other way but because I increased my probabilities of success, I ended up making money. So take advantage of this. Here is the link. I'm also throwing it out there in the chat window. I think, uh, I'm, I don't know if I put it in there. Um, let me see if I can throw it in there. There's the, uh, the link in the chat window. Uh, you guys can click on that. It's a hot link. It should pull up uh, the window. It's gonna just pull up this right here, same thing. Uh, you get all of those classes, how to set up your platform, all of that historical volatility versus implied volatility, why I like implied volatility more so, and setting up your screens, your trading platform, all of that stuff uh, is covered in this, um, this course for $497. And like I said, if you're watching on tape delay, though, you're going to have to push this into your uh, URL. Otherwise, if you're watching it on live TV, and you can just click on the window over there in the chat window. All right. Um, uh, could you show adjust the iron condor into an iron butterfly? So you just adjust. Yes. You just adjust. Yes. Uh, sorry, I was reading another comment. You uh, adjust the short iron condor into an iron butterfly. Yes, Wally. Sometimes you can actually do it where you keep it as an iron Condor, in our case, we were looking at it, just moving it to the 151 puts, right? We moved it so the short call and the short put were the same. But, you know, sometimes you could do it where you move it down uh, to the 153 calls. So then you have a little bit of room and it's still considered an iron condor and uh, it could land in between there still. But yes, you can adjust it. Uh, could you put the slide of the chart where you showed the price going down? Um, you know what? I don't know if I can because uh, with this, when I use this, it erases it. Actually, you know what? I might be able to. I just thought of something. Was it on when we were talking about with this? Let's see if I can do something so like that. If I can go back a window. Is that what you're talking about? So yeah, so when we were talking about this on the chart, my 173 calls are way up here. It's above where the market was trading, which is why I like this trade. I think if we're going to stay within this little area here. Uh, we might go a little bit higher, but I think I personally, it's not a trade recommendation, but I'm just looking at it thinking, I think gold's going to trend sideways. Uh, but if I'm wrong and it starts trickling down, then you know the beauty in this strategy is I can buy back that call spread, get a little bit more aggressive, move my call spread down here or whatever, whatever I'm thinking. Um, and if it started rallying up, then I'd get out of the put spread and move it higher. I have not. You know, one thing I don't do, I don't like to do, and I, I'm not going to say I never do, but one thing I don't necessarily like to do is I hate the whole theory of somebody thinking I'm pumping and dumping a, a, a strategy. So, you know, it's up in the air. Tomorrow I'm going to look at it. Um, and if it still looks as attractive as it did today, I'm going to put it on. I like to put them on after the webinar. 
So nobody says, well, you put that strategy on and now you're, you, you know, you're telling us to do it. I'm not ever, ever, ever telling anyone to put on a strategy that I did. I do not believe in the lemming mentality or the herd mentality. Lemmings are those little ferret looking guys. And the thing is they get in a big herd mentality and they start running. And the thing is, is when the, the leader runs off of a cliff, basically the rest of them run off the cliff too. And no, I do not agree with that at all. I'm, I'm putting on trades based on my assumptions. And uh, yes, on my daily market commentaries, you can follow along with that because I talk about every single trade I do, when and where I put them on, whether they're win, lose, or draw. Um, so yeah, you can basically uh, keep an eye on that. And you know, no, I don't talk about how well I do on every given trade uh, and say, or I, I shouldn't say that. I do talk about every win, lose, or draw trade, but I don't talk about performance. I'm not allowed to talk about performance. Um, SEC would, I don't know how some people get away with it, but uh, SEC would probably come after me. Uh, I'm almost sure of that. So I can't talk about performance, but you guys can keep track of my performance. I'm, I'm very open. All right, so later webinars, I'm gonna be drilling down on different option components, when and where I find them. Here's also a link to that. You know, like I said, you guys can take advantage of it over there in the chat window. And finally, one last thing that we also have to talk about is, this is all for educational purposes and I don't think I've said it enough. I'm not trying to give you guys investment advice. Please do your own homework, all right? So if you can't take that, take it easy. Bye for now, you guys. Thank you. Appreciate you guys.